Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Whether to refresh North Carolina's Economic Development Incentive Bank continues to be hotly debated, at least in the Tar Heel State. The argument can be made that fixing education, whatever that means, can neutralize much of the need to use gross dollars as a way to recruit in economic development. Welcome back. Thanks for supporting the most widely watched and the longest running dialogue on North and South Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William and what does fixing education mean? Seems we all want the same or similar outcomes. So why is getting there so acutely disputed? We will pull on that thread of thought and later on considering this an exit interview. But before leaving for his new job in Virginia, we welcome back Scott Rawls from North Carolina's Community Colleges. Please stay with us. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services and by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Mebin Rash from EdNC, Scott Price from the South Carolina School Boards Association, and special guest, Dr. Scott Rawls, president of the North Carolina Community College System. Now, here's Chris Williams. Hello, welcome to our program. Mevin, welcome back. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Scott, uh, good to have you here, welcome. Thank you for having me. Depending on your experience, we hope you come back. And I don't mean from our point of view, but hope it's not too painful well, for you. Depending on how I do, I hope you invite me back. <laughs> okay. Well said. Um, Guys, let's start with something. At, at the top of the program, we talked about economic incentives and how that relates to education. There has been a debate going on. Uh, clearly, South Carolina is running rings around North Carolina and economic development. Volvo, the announcement about Volvo, Daimler-Benz, of course, Boeing, and many other things that don't even see the light of day in the media have been going on in South Carolina. It's big wins. Mm -hmm. And North Carolina is playing a bit of the blame game around economic development. And that is, should we, be, should we have economic incentives? Who's to blame about that? I, and I want to get into that. But, Mevin, I'll start with you. If we fixed... If we got education right in North Carolina, or at least got it right to how we define it in the Carolinas, and if we got transportation right, would we even have to worry about writing an economic development incentive check to win business? Well, I think you're right that these things aren't connected. And in North Carolina, in 59 counties, the public schools are the largest employer. And so that tells you that if we make investments in education, that's gonna have an impact in both our rural and our urban areas. The budget picture in North Carolina has recently changed. Mm -hmm. We thought we were facing a $270 million shortfall. And we got a nice April surprise, and we have about a $400 million surplus. And when you add in the reversions, that's over $800 million that we can invest, and education's gonna be a priority, and so we're gonna see. Do you think the GOP in North Carolina will make that a priority around education with those new dollars found? I think you see in the governor's budget and the house budget that this education is a priority and we know that there's some consensus around the things they want to fund. They want to increase teacher salaries. We want to maintain where teacher assistants are. We want to fund enrollment growth fully. We want to up the textbook and digital resources that are available in the classroom so that this is felt all the way throughout the system. You know, the debate in South Carolina, Scott, is probably a little um, uh, less acute because South Carolina has been hitting on all eight cylinders, so to speak, around economic development. Correct. But, but and again, back to the first question with Mebin, uh, would we have to be so particular about having a 
let me call it a slush fund for South Carolina Commerce or North Carolina Commerce to write a big check as an incentive if we got education and transportation fixed? I think that one of the things that we're starting to realize in South Carolina is that education and economic development and the business industry all go together. They go hand in hand. And I think that if we can continue with what we're doing in terms of workforce development, which is a big thing that our governor's been pushing, and right. we're kind of, we're, we in South Carolina, for the first time in a long time, are moving in the same direction. Uh, and that is towards what we want to, to see in a graduate um, in the 21st century. And uh, workforce development is at the top of that top of that list. And so I think that it, it, it does tend to sort of take away from the need to have these huge pots of money for economic development incentives if you have a stronger education system. And I think we're starting to see that. Yeah, so South Carolina starts strong. And I, and I mean this in a good way. So a lot of good announcements, uh, a lot of, uh, of elephant hunting, so to speak, and a lot of big employers have announced. But what happens after kind of the party is over, Scott? How do you fund education going forward in the Palmetto State? Is that this proposal around uh, a statewide property tax? Or as Mevin talked about, maybe some found money in a surplus in South Carolina's budget? I think the only way that we're going to move forward in terms of education funding in South Carolina is if we, if we have a comprehensive reform, not only with education funding, but I think with our tax system too. Uh, the, the two are tied together, education funding and, and tax reform. And we've got a recent Supreme Court rule in the Abbeville decision that was released in November. So there's a lot of discussion now about education funding reform going into the next legislative session. The uniform millage rate issue that, that you've talked about is actually a plan that the School Boards Association uh, has been sponsoring for the past four years. It's called the South Carolina Jobs and Education Tax Act, or SCJET. And we've had bills filed in the last several legislative sessions, and we're hoping to get some traction on that in the next year. You know, is there any way to change this culture around education instead of, and, and, you, and you all articulate well, and articulate it well, and you're doing great work down, you know, down on the ground. But how do we change this dialogue around the culture of education in the Carolinas? How do we make it mu a much more international approach where it's part of the DNA of a family and you, and you don't have to incentivize parents to be engaged in a kid's education or a school or a business, Scott, to, to say, listen, you need to be funding the school or the school system. I mean, how do we change the DNA of this? So I don't know that we have to change it. I mean, I think a lot of people in North Carolina would argue that education is part of our DNA. It's something that both parties have been proud of for a very long time. They understand that investments in a strong economy and a strong education system, and as you said, a strong transportation system, those are the things that will bring people to North Carolina, businesses and individuals. And I think we're at this really interesting point in time in North Carolina where we're gonna learn about a lot about what it looks like to be a purple state. We've got this surplus, what are we gonna do with it? Are we gonna make investments in the rainy day fund, in the repairs and renovations fund, or are we gonna spend it all? And that's gonna be interesting to watch. We're gonna learn a lot about what it means to be physically conservative. We're gonna learn a lot about what the spending priorities are for the state. Scott, what do you think? Same question. Well, I think it starts at the top, and I think in South Carolina, I mentioned... Starts at the top politically or starts at the top in, in business and industry? Politically, I think, uh, where, where you have an emphasis on public education, and we are seeing that now. Um, we very recently had a um, newly elected state superintendent of education. Mm -hmm. It's very pro-public education. We've got a governor now who's talking about public education. Haven't had that in a long time. And you're starting to see some some uh, some of the economic development interests that are that are looking at South Carolina. So I think it, it needs to start at the top, but also think that education can't be the the lone focus in terms of how you um, move your state forward. I think you need to, need to look at it holistically, and that's one of the things that getting back to the SC Jet. The, the funding plan that, w that we were talking about. Just What's that acronym stand for? By uh, way? South Carolina Jobs, Education, and Tax yeah. Act. Okay. But one of the things that we included in there with the uniform millage rate is to, and we set it at 100 mills statewide, and that's, that levels the playing field economic, for economic development in South Carolina. And that's one of the things that's very pro-economic uh, development about that plan is it levels the, the playing field by lowering the millage rate statewide so that some of these poor rural communities would have a better shot at attracting industry. 
Uh, and thank you for that nice little segue, by the way, Scott. Uh, we do happen to have Molly Spearman, which is Superintendent of Education in South Carolina, along with June Atkinson it's going great. Uh, from North Carolina's uh, school, superintendent schools, uh, together on a program coming up this summer. Uh, a lot more to talk about in education. Uh, guys, please stay with us. Next week on this program, his name is Brad Wilson. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, but his dialogue goes way beyond health care. Brad is engaged in many things, including education, including economic development, and we'll get some ideas from Brad on both of those issues. And then in two weeks, uh, Dr. Phil Dubois from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte will join us as well. Our guest has at least a couple of critical skills, certainly understanding the role of education in communities and community development. But maybe more importantly, he is politically informed and nimble to be effectively articulate to the issues back to lawmakers. In other words, they listen to him. He is leaving as president of the North Carolina Community College System later this year in September to head Northern Virginia Community College, which is the second largest community college in this country. We welcome back to the dialogue, Dr. Scott Rawls. Scott, welcome. Good Thanks, to have you. Chris. Good to be back. Um, let me just say at the top of the program, hate you're leaving, and I'm not the only one that feels that way, uh, not just because you're a good guy, Scott, but because you have been effective at the community college system. So let's use this as an exit interview, if you don't mind, Scott, and tell me what would you say would be important for North Carolina uh, political leaders and business leaders? What do they need to hear and what do we need to be doing right now before it's too late? I think uh, we need to be more like us. Uh, what I would say is let's pay attention to the way we've been uh, for during my lifetime, last 50, 60 years. I think North Carolina's pulled off a remarkable accomplishment. We, I don't think there's a state in the nation that has had the combination of higher education, accessibility, and quality more so than North Carolina. I think that's been tough to maintain. I mean, it's not easy to do that, and I think it's gonna be difficult in the future but I think that's part of who we are, and I think it's made a big difference for kids from middle class backgrounds like myself uh, who wouldn't have the opportunities we've had if it wasn't for those opportunities. So I hope we can keep that combination of accessibility and quality uh, long into the future. You know, you, you see some of the inner workings in the General Assembly. But obviously, you're in the purview. You're close uh, physically, but also uh, politically, you have a, a pretty good sense on things. W with the GOP firmly in control in North Carolina now, they've been accused of overreaching both socially, fiscally, politically. When you strip all of that away, just given your comments, do you feel like the GOP, the Republicans in North Carolina, can be responsible for holding on and building back the brand of education in North Carolina? No, I think they can. No, I, I do. I, you know, sometimes I, I have very good Democratic friends and I have very good Republican friends. And sometimes I think the differences, particularly for those who are closer to the middle of each side, are, are not that far apart. Um, I think one of the bigger differences in North Carolina is that uh, North Carolina is a changing state. We have many people who are moving into North Carolina. And I think North Carolina pulled itself out from being what was the second poorest state in the nation to a thriving, strong state through an emphasis on education, through investments in higher education. I think that's, I believe that's how we got to how, to where we are with, uh, with other investments as well. And I hope that that realization carries forward. I see it in both Democratic leaders and Republican leaders, but I think that's a North Carolina way. I don't think it's necessarily one party over the other. Mm -hmm. no. So my question starts with thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful leadership, for your dedicated public service, and for your tireless, tireless advocacy for the students in the colleges. You're very kind. You are thank gonna you, be ma missed. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna push a little bit on what Chris said. And I'm very curious about the challenges and the opportunities. You're so good at talking to us about thinking about the opportunities and not just defining the challenges. But I'm more interested at this transition moment in the challenges and what keeps you up at night as you think about the community colleges in North Carolina moving forward and what we should be worried about. Well, I think one of the things that's important is to realize how big and how much of an impact community colleges have in North Carolina. 40% uh, of all the wage earners in our state right now have been a student at one of the 58 colleges in the last 10 years. We're over half, or almost half of all undergraduates. We're 46% of the higher ed impact. We have 30,000 public school students who go to school on community college campuses. We are Murphy to Manio, and 
I guess one regret that I do have is that given the scale and the reach and the impact that community colleges have, sometimes I feel like they are not recognized as much for that impact. And I think it's important to recognize that in order to make the investments that will be necessary for the future. Well, your creating success campaign is at least a step in the right direction towards making sure people understand the importance of the system. Scott. I'd just like to follow up on what Mevin said and um, ask you to tell me how um, the success in North Carolina with the community college system, how that could translate into South Carolina. What can K through 12 and community college system do to better work together? Well, interesting, our, our history, it did translate <coughs> to North Carolina. In fact, mm -hmm. the, the, the South Carolina system was very much developed um, with the actual leaders from North Carolina who, who were part of that, Wade Martin, back in many years ago. I think, I think one thing about our two systems is we're very workforce focused, we're very jobs focused. I think that's important. I think one thing that North Carolina has is a great, a great thing about North Carolina that I think other states should look at is how the, the parts of education work together. So in North Carolina, our system was very much, Bill Friday, who was leader in the UNC system, was very influential on in how we started the development of community colleges. There hasn't been tension in that regard. So universities and community colleges have worked very closely together. And then the public school efforts. Um, we have, I think, more students are, are a richer what we call dual enrollment environments, where high school students take college courses at community colleges. We have a third of all the early colleges in the United States are on our campuses. I think big things happen between systems. Mm -hmm. I think community colleges are the seam and seamless education. And I think that's an important element of who we are and where we fit into the fabric. And I think that's an important part of it. You know, and not to interrupt you, Scott, but go back to something. You talk about early college and, and middle college is what it's called mm -hmm. in some places. H how do you navigate the idea that the General Assembly, and it's, it's not unique to North Carolina, but it, it would happen in the State House in Columbia, um, they look at funding middle colleges and think, well, wait a minute, this is redundant, then why are we giving money to high schools if we're gonna be funding middle colleges? How, how, do, how, how do you answer that argument about well, that, that really hasn't been an argument no? in North Carolina. Um, I think the early colleges are smaller, their own college campuses. Um, they were championed by uh, Governor Easley, but they have been accepted broadly by political leaders across the, the state. And I think, I think that's an important element of educational progress that you see is um, good ideas come from different leaders from different parties and when folks can build on things as opposed to just start new things or mm -hmm. have to recreate. And I think that's been a good North Carolina story. Mm -hmm. I think we have been able to make progress around different things. But I think that the notion of collaboration between say public schools and community colleges is not just an early college phenomenon. It goes back to career tech prep started in Richmond County in North Carolina and then grew to a national uh, effort. So I think there's a lot of examples of community college, public school, community college, university, and university and public school collaboration in North Carolina. That's part of who we are. That really needs to continue in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, back in the 80s, I was one of the first kids that benefited from early college. I was at East Mecklenburg and I took classes at CPCC. So this is not a new mm -hmm. thing um, in North Carolina. I want to go back to the seam and seamless education and talk about it through the lens of SWIRL. So help us understand what SWIRL is and how you think about it and why it's important going forward as the education system changes. I see this happening in the K-12 level between home schools and private mm -hmm. schools and charter schools and traditional schools, but you've got a different vantage point well, on that. Well, too often I think we think either or. So you're either career technical or your college prep, you're either community college or your university, when the truth is it's a lot of and, um, mm -hmm. and you can see it, you can see it in data. Uh, uh, almost half of all four-year graduates last year had some community college experience in terms of, of taking community college courses or, or or actually being there multiple semesters. Um, you can see it in terms of students who come back to community colleges somewhat as a finishing school. 15% right. of all our nursing students have four year degrees when they come into our nursing programs. And you see that in areas like information technology, biotechnology programs. So the swirl means that we are not so much you go here, you go here, you go here. A lot of times you go through all three, that's why efforts like we've really put a lot of attention on articulation mm -hmm. agreements between 
community colleges, universities, and there's also articulation between public schools and community colleges is so important because of that swirl to make sure that students aren't having to repeat things and step backward as they move forward. So wait, let me follow, I'm sorry, Scott, let me follow up on that. So are you saying it's important to have agreements between, as you said, between community colleges and high schools or community colleges and four-year degrees? To, to have it articulated out or to allow it to grow into something else? Well, both, but I think to be clear about what counts and to, be, and to be clear about pathways that, uh, you know, so many of our students who come to us, they come to us for two reasons. They come to us either to get a job or to get to a university. We're pathway colleges, mm -hmm. I say. We're not as much destination colleges. So what's important is to make sure that we're clear about those pathways. So when we're working with those students who want to come to us for universities, we have to make sure, and I think I'm really proud of what we've been able to do in recent years with our partnerships with the universities to really clear those pathways to make sure there's more guarantees in place for students who move from community colleges to universities because the data clearly shows that if you carry with you your credits, you're much more likely, two and a half times more likely, to get a bachelor's degree. So that's why it's so important to make sure the pathways are not just mm -hmm. between institutions or within systems, but across systems. Mm -hmm. Scott, thank you, I'm sorry. To that's okay. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you is, you know, South Carolina is a poor, small state, limited resources. Um, one of the issues that we've litigated for the past 20 years uh, is an education funding suit, equitable funding. How do you ensure that the advantages that you can that you can see through the, the uh, community college system work in every community? Every school district would have the opportunity to do the uh, in the early colleges that you talked about and the dual enrollment. Well, I think that's one of the things I'm proud about in North Carolina is in terms of accessibility, it's also about geographic accessibility. So, if you're in um, you know Martin County or if you're in Yancey County, you've got just as much opportunity as if you're in Wake or Charlotte. Um, maybe not the breadth of programs, but you certainly have the same opportunities and the same focus. And a lot of times we give a great deal of focus in rural areas. I think though one of the things I do worry about is there's a growing stratification in terms of socioeconomic status in higher education. And community colleges is where that really is hitting now. So if you look at community colleges across the nation, 58% of our students uh, come from the lower 50% of the income bracket. You take mm -hmm. the top 200 elite colleges, those that everybody knows, right. you know, only 14% of the population, of their enrollment is coming from that bottom 50%. It's growing wider, it's not coming together. And community colleges play a more important role. I do worry that, um, I really do worry that the biggest issue we face is the access to the American dream. I mean, what makes us unique, economic mm. opportunity for all. And I do think that comes through education. Mm. And I think <laughs> that if poor kids cannot start early the right way, and if, they're, and if they go to universities or community colleges which have vastly different resources, it can be challenging. And I, I do think you can clearly see in the data there's a greater stratification between poor and rich in terms of where students are going beyond high school. Is that, is that mostly because of the uns unsustainable cost of higher education? Yeah, I think, I, I don't think higher education is doing itself a service in that regard. I think that, you know, we had a period of time, some have called it the lost decade between 1999 and 2009 where tuition has exploded right. and, and we know that uh, medium incomes have not um, exploded. And so what you see is that not just if you're from a poor family, but even more so uh, middle class families because a lot of times they don't have access to some of the financial aid resources. So you see that more students from working class families and middle class families are turning to community colleges um, because of the financial issues. I think also we we do a good job in terms of quality. I think people mm -hmm. do see their community colleges a little differently than they did uh, 10, 20 years ago. But I do think that the finances are driving more students, it's clear to community colleges relative to some sectors of uh, four-year education. Yeah. Scott, uh, we're, that's it, we're out of time. That's a half an hour, it always goes by too quickly. Um, thank you uh, for, as Mevin said so eloquently, thank thanks for your service to North Carolina. You're gonna be missed. And, and you know, Washington and Northern Virginia gets to find out how good you really are, so good luck up there. You're very kind, I'm Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred, and I we're won't be back on before you I'm Tar Heel dead. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Scott, please come back, good to have you. Mevin, always good to be here. Thank you. All right. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Thank you.
Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.